Hello and welcome to Pathway Online. We are so glad you could be with us today. No matter where you are or how you might be watching, join us now as we sing out to our amazing Heavenly Father.
Hello again, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Ben Marshall, and it is so good to be with you. Now, here's a question for you. Okay, I guess it's three, actually. Do you want to know your Bible better? Do you desire to know God more intimately? And would you like to pursue those goals with others who share that same passion? Well, this fall, you can do all three when our men's and women's Bible study begins on Tuesday, September 6th. During our journey through the book of Exodus, we'll revisit some famous scenes from the Old Testament and explore how God leads us into a new life with Christ. For your convenience, we'll gather both in person and online. You can get complete details and sign up at womenatpathway.com. Unfortunately, we've seen it again and again. The aftermath of a divorce or separation can be awful. The pain in the pit of your stomach, a song comes on the radio and it unleashes a flood of memories. It hurts and we understand, but you can heal and we'd love to help. Our next session of Divorce Care begins on Monday, September 19th at the Chippewa campus. This weekly support group is led by those who have also experienced separation or divorce, and our desire is to walk with you toward hope and healing. Please don't let another day go by without seeking help. You can sign up today by calling our church office. And one more thing, if you're newer to Pathway and you'd like to learn more about who we are and what we offer, then we'd love to meet you at our newcomer's luncheon on Sunday, September 25th. We'll gather in the cafe right after our second service, and you can enjoy a free meal, some relaxing conversation, and ask us anything about our church. Okay, let's once again prepare our hearts as we continue to worship our Heavenly Father. You were the word at the beginning, one with You 
good and worthy of our praise. Let's continue to sing his praises together. He is a devoted God, one whose love knows no end, that went to the cross for us. devoted like a ring of solid gold like a vow that is tested like a covenant of old and your love is enduring through the winter rain and beyond the horizon with mercy for today
This evening we're going to partake in communion, and before I go into that, I just want to make sure if you've not gotten this, you can raise your hand, we'll get it, but these are uh, what we do for communion, and if you don't know how to do this, it's two layers. The first layer is a very small layer you can uh, peel away, and that is where the bread is, and then you peel away the second layer, and that is where the cup is. So I just want to give a little instructions for that. I love communion as if you have a relationship with Christ, if you've crossed that line of faith, communion is very tender to us as believers. It's because it really deals with our past, our present, and our future. And I love that. I love that about our Jesus. Because our past, we know that our past, our sins have been forgiven. No matter what we've done, God says he separates that as far as east is from west. And our sins, if we, if we know Jesus, our sins are forgiven because of what Jesus did on the cross. And then we have present. Because Jesus didn't die, he rose again. And now we have the Holy Spirit. So God says presently today that he's never going to leave us and he's never going to forsake us. That his Holy Spirit is with us today, counseling us, comforting us, encouraging us and then deals with our future, which is what? God has prepared a place for us in heaven. If we know him, we have eternity with him. We get to look forward to spending our day worshiping him, just like we're doing now. In scripture, and we see this, and I just want to read to you. Uh, we, see it in the, we see it in the Gospels, but we also see it in 1 Corinthians, which I want to read. And it's really when Jesus was with his disciples at the Last Supper, and he's having communion. He's really telling them about what's going to happen to him. And he says, The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, it says he broke it. And he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So every time we take communion, we proclaim Jesus' death. But not just his death, his resurrection. So what I want to do is I just want to encourage you to peel off the first layer. And we're going to take the bread together right now. As you do this, I just want to encourage you, this, this little wafer represents Christ's body that was beaten for us, broken for us. Let's take this now. And as you peel off the second layer, this juice really does signify his blood, his atoning sacrifice that was shed for us on the cross. This is why Jesus came, was to shed his blood for us. Let's drink. Father, we thank you for your unbelievable sacrifice once and for all to make us right with you. Because of what you did on the cross, your body being broken and beaten for us, and your blood that was shed for us, we will live with you. We thank you for not only forgiving of us our sins, but separating that as far as east is from west. Father, right now we commit our time, but we not only commit our time, we commit our lives to you that you may be honored and glorified through all that we say and do. And we ask this in your blessed Son's name. Amen. Oh Lord, you searched me.
glory fills the highest place. What can separate me now? You go. Father God, we are so thankful that you make a way for us. 
because Lord, we are broken, so broken that sometimes it's really hard to love ourselves, Lord. But we know that even in that, in those dark, dark places, you still love us. And we are so thankful for that, Father. Thank you that you reach down into the pit, into those dark places in our lives, and you are willing to pull us out of those places. Father, thank you that your love follows us no matter where we are, um, no matter whether we are running in the opposite direction or whether we are crawling back towards you, Lord. So I just pray that we would be able to enter into today, enter into worship, enter into the sermon and hearing your word, Lord, with joy and thanksgiving, Father. Just humble hearts filled with thanks for what you have done for us, Lord. At the cross, you said, it is finished. And that was it. We are thankful for that moment, Lord. Thankful that that moment continues and stretches over everyone who loves you. Father, thank you for loving us first so that we could love you back. And we just pray all of these things, Lord, in your precious Son's name. In the name of Jesus, thank you. Amen. Welcome, welcome. New face on the platform. I'm so happy to be here with you today. My name is Steve Pink. I'm the communications director here at Pathway, and I have the opportunity, the the honor, to continue our Romans series that we've been in. Uh, I get to communicate to you about that tonight. And uh, we've uh, been in this series on Romans for some time now, right? We've been walking through it, and it's been, I'm sure it's been as much of a blessing for all of you as it's been for me. In the book of Romans, we've been learning all about how the grace of God, the grace of God, his free and unmerited love, favor, and blessings, the reality of it and the understanding of it, how this grace literally changes everything. And as we've been traveling through Romans, Paul's been teaching us what it means to be a truly great follower of Christ. And he concludes chapter 13 with this powerful verse. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. So Paul says, run after God with all you have, totally committed to Jesus with your whole heart. And then in chapter four, which we're getting into tonight, Paul's kind of like this. And now, about these new convictions you have. About those new convictions. Because the moment somebody decides that they're all in for Jesus, that their whole life is about following Christ, Well, they can start to get a a little bit difficult. I don't know if you've ever noticed that before. They can start to get a little bit judgmental. So I became a Christian a little bit later on in my life, at the age of 30, and it was really, of course, a profound event. I had what some call a born-again experience, and my life became radically, radically different. And I was really on fire for God, and thankfully I still am. And I got immediately involved in a healthy, thriving local church, and I attended every service, every class, every special event, and I volunteered for practically everything. I was like on every team, volunteered for the kids ministry, student ministry, ushers, tech team. I was everywhere, not security. We didn't have security back then. Unfortunately, we need it today, but that wasn't around then. But I volunteered for everything, man. I was into it. I didn't know anything about the church or the Bible, (laughs) like nothing but I was very hungry to learn it all. I loved being there, and people seemed to enjoy having this fired up, enthusiastic new Christian on the team. So I'm going to all these services and all these classes, and I'm reading multiple Bibles and commentaries, learning as much as I can. You guys remember Family Christian Bookstore? You guys remember that? It was like this, this, this chain bookstore that was really like quite a thing for Christians, you know, and it's like got all this beautiful stuff and pretty stuff up front, gifts, Christian themes, gifts, Christian candy, all kinds of interesting stuff. But in the back, they had like this, this resource section, like all these study Bibles and commentaries and all this kind of stuff, and I was there constantly. 
I was there all the time, like trying to get new resources. This was back before you could easily rent or buy that stuff on the internet. And I was there just all the time, and I just loved being there, reading that stuff, buying that stuff. So I got a lot of that stuff. And I really was trying to catch up with my more mature brothers and, Christian, and sisters in Christ. The people at the church that I went to, thankfully, were very healthy Christians, passionate Christians, committed Christians. They were into it, and I felt like I was light years away from where they were spiritually. I just didn't know any of that stuff, and I didn't know how to get there. So I wanted to catch up badly. And somewhere in about year two or so, I started to realize that, hey, there's a lot of rules in here. There's a lot of rules in this thing. There's all these laws and commandments and principles and guidelines. And here's me, this very new, very enthusiastic, very committed Christian, and I'm like, I need to take this stuff seriously. And I need to start doing my best to live this stuff out in my life. I'm sure you guys have heard, maybe you've heard about the guy that spent the year living biblically. Did you, guys, you hear about this guy? Uh, he wrote a book about it. There was like a show about it. There's been all, since then, there's been all kinds of videos and uh, you know, stories about it, different pieces and things. And uh, he spent an entire year living by every letter of the law in the Bible. He wrote a book about it. And it's an incredibly interesting story, but needless to say, a lot of it was a train wreck. He was living in New York at the time, trying to be living biblically, again, literally to the letter of the law. Um, he actually tried to commit, or to uh, perform animal sacrifices, if you can imagine that, and all kinds of other weird stuff. He went out of his way to stone adulterers in the street. All right? Crazy stuff. Now, I was nowhere near that bad. Nowhere near. I fairly quickly developed an understanding of the difference between the old and the new covenants in the church and the different expectations that we have as Christ followers from the ancient Jews in the Old Testament. But in truth, there's some extremely high standards there as well, right? As a Christ follower. Matthew 16, 24, Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. What's that mean? Hmm. Hmm deny myself, my wants, my needs, my preferences, my comforts, all the things I think I deserve. I got to deny that? Interesting. 1 John 2, 4, whoever says I know him but does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. Woo, ouch. And then there's all that Sermon on the Mount stuff and love your enemy stuff and on and on it goes. Some pretty intense stuff. And if I'm being honest, as I started to take the Bible more and more seriously, my life started to become very similar to that guy from the book in a lot of uncomfortable ways. I started to close myself off from a lot of things in my life. Movies, television, secular music. I stopped drinking any kind of alcohol and eventually even stopped drinking caffeine. My lifestyle changed dramatically and I slowly closed myself off into smaller and smaller boxes. Everything around me appeared polluted with sin. And I was doing everything I could to stay away from it and not get infected by it. Needless to say, all the people that once loved having this enthusiastic new Christian on the team, well, they were starting to get pretty annoyed with Steve and his new convictions. I was running around, you know, constantly questioning everything and judging everyone. Eventually, as this process frequently goes, I entered into a season of despair, I entered into a season of crisis. What had once been a fantastic and miraculous new life in Christ had now become a life of anxiety, frustration, and misery. Nothing and no one was pure enough. So how do you live with that? How do you do that? Fortunately, it was at this point that a wonderful pastor at the church that I had started to attend attend, really stepped in in a powerful way and helped mentor me through this season of agony. And over the next six months, he walked me through a book about the four stages of spiritual growth. I'm not sure if you guys have ever seen this stuff before. Uh, I'm not necessarily recommending this book in particular, but there's there's a variety of books about this kind of a topic. They were very popular in our church and in the Christian circles we ran in back in the day when we were doing that stuff. But he brought it, he It was like the perfect timing and the perfect thing for me to begin to understand, and he helped walk me through it. Um, And I'm not going to take the time to go into any of this stuff in any great detail here today, but suffice it to say 
that there's four typical stages to this process. Now again, I got saved at 30. A little different than growing up in the church or being exposed to Christianity at a younger age or whatever. Different experience. They're, they're sta- they might go through the similar stages but in a different way or there might be seven stages or nine stages. I don't know what that looks like. But for somebody that got born again at the age of 30, these four stages fit like a glove. So, first stage, formation. This is your spiritual infancy. I just got born again. I don't know anything, but I love everything. I love God. I love people. I'm ready to do this. You're on fire for Jesus, but you have no conception of biblical truths whatsoever. Then stage two, construction. You gain a very literal grasp of biblical truths, lacking any kind of sophistication or nuance. You're just very literal. You can become legalistic, judgmental, and fundamentalistic, and that's exactly what I was doing in my constructional phase. Then, this inevitably, inevitably and typically leads to what's called crisis. The constructional phase proves unsustainable, and the authenticity of your faith begins to come into question. You start to question, was this real at all? If all of this is real, why has it led me into this like depression? Why has it led me into this dark place? That can't be, that can't be right and you start to question the entire process. And then, praise God, (laughs) and thanks for the intervention of that pastor, you can enter into a stage that's called synthesis. You re-engage your faith with a more sophisticated understanding of Christian life. You begin to grasp the very powerful and very mysterious and incredible dynamic between internal transformation and external behavior between what God's doing in your heart and changing your heart and transforming your heart and healing your heart and changing your character and all of the rules and the laws and the behavior and the ritual, etc. You start to develop a dynamic relationship between the two and you're re-engaged. You're healthy. You're happy again. And you're more mature. And now as we enter into Romans chapter 14, Paul begins addressing this conflict between those who are still in the construction phase, which he calls the weak, and those who have reached a stage of mature synthesis. And he begins with this direct declaration in verse 1. Accept the one whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters. Accept them and don't quarrel with them over disputable matters. And so chapter 14 is all about these disputable matters. And this is what Pastor Ben introduced us to last week in the first half of this chapter. He talked about the kinds of disputable matters that can divide the church. Matters that aren't you know, necessarily literally black or white, that aren't explicitly righteous or unrighteous. And he concluded that rather than cause division over our personal opinions, our hearts must be to seek unity in eternal matters rather than division in disputable matters. Our hearts must be this. And that's what Paul is addressing in the first half of chapter 14. So Paul's emphasis in in the first half of chapter 14 is on the importance of unity in the body of Christ, despite our differences of opinion over disputable matters. And now as Paul moves into the second half of chapter 14, his focus begins to shift a little bit. And whereas the first half of the chapter was more about the spiritually weak, and their specific hang-ups. The second half of the chapter is focused more on the spiritually strong and their freedom from those hang-ups. And Paul wants to caution them about how they choose to live in their newfound freedoms. And he begins this second half of the chapter with this famous verse. Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of your brother. Now, as I said, this is a pretty famous passage of Scripture, and most of us know it better in its abbreviated form. Don't cause your brother to stumble. And I'm sure that most of you have heard this verse applied or misapplied in a variety of different contexts. But what does it actually mean? What is Paul trying to get at? teach us here in this part of the chapter. So I'd like to briefly address a few of the primary ways this verse has popularly been applied. And as you might well imagine, there's a lot of landmines that I could easily step on when I talk about this. So fun fun for Steve, his first time teaching on the platform at Pathway, I get this passage about not causing your brother to stumble, which actually I'm loving it, so don't worry about me. 
But fortune favors the brave, right? Fortune favors, I think it says that in the Bible somewhere, right? No, maybe, I don't know. Anyway, we're gonna wade into that minefield briefly here at the beginning because I think it's important. You ready? Let's do it. So by far, we should be doing like a family feud here. Who thinks the most popular version of this verse is? What's the, how do we most frequently apply it? By far, the way this verse has been applied has been to drinking alcohol. Right? That's the way it's been most significantly applied. Typically, the concern is for the influence drinking can have on impressionable people, particularly the young or those that struggle with addiction. And both of these concerns are certainly very valid. But perhaps a more accurate take on this with regard to this verse and what Paul's talking about and who he's talking to is that we're not to drink around other Christians who are convinced that drinking alcohol is a sin. That's kind of what Paul's talking about. And as I've already shared, this would very much have been me during that constructional phase that I went through years ago. So the question is, is drinking alcohol actually sinful? Some say yes, some say no. And the Bible is is somewhat unclear on the issue in, in reality. But what is explicitly clear, however, is that Christians are never to get drunk. That is clear. Ephesians 5.18, Galatians 5.19-25, now the works of the flesh are evidence, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So there is that. But how much drinking is drunk? What's the blood alcohol level? How did they test that back in the Old Testament or the, New Te- the early New Testament? Is it okay to get a buzz? Is that okay? Nice social buzz, feeling funny and playful. And what's an acceptable setting for drinking? Is it okay to drink a glass of wine at home on the couch? Or is it also cool for you to go out to the club with your friends? Where's the limit? Or should we just take the safest possible route and avoid it altogether? As so many believers that I've had relationship with have done. So as perhaps becomes clear, I'm not going to give you an answer to that because this is a debatable issue. And this is precisely what Paul is getting at. He's addressing the divisions we form over debatable issues like this. The next, ding, the next most common application of this verse has been as it relates to, drum roll, modesty. Yep, I'm going there a little bit. And this has historically been applied primarily to who? Women. Of course, but it can just as easily be applied to men and probably increasingly so in our current cultural context. So guys, we're not off the hook on this one. And the common concern here is that if a believer dresses provocatively in a uniquely revealing and sexual way, they will likely cause others to fall into temptation and sexual sin. And this too is a very valid concern. But how revealing is too revealing? What's the standard? And again, this is a very relative, very culturally informed uh, topic. Just 80 years ago, some of you might recall that it was inappropriate for a woman to show her ankles below her dress. I think we've moved a little bit beyond that standard, don't you think? So what should Christian standards of modesty look like today? And once again, the Bible isn't very clear about this topic But Paul would caution us to take it seriously nonetheless, as well as many other similarly debatable issues. For example, what kind of entertainment can Christians engage in? What TV shows and movies are appropriate for a Christian to watch? Rated PG, rated R, how much explicit content is allowed? This is all debatable. But one thing that is clear is do not watch the Hallmark Channel at any cost. That stuff will pull you in ways you simply cannot come back from. All right? Stay away. Danger. (laughs) How about music? What kind of music can a Christian listen to? Only worship or anything secular? Hard rock, metal, pop, rap? And again, how explicit can the content be? And by listening to it or watching these things and so on and so forth, might you possibly cause your brother or sister to stumble? Once again, this is a debatable issue. 
but I would caution you against listening to country music. That stuff can mess you up. <laughs> well, you know, you've had to hear about what kind of concerts Kenny Chesney has, right? Not to point fingers. I think he destroyed Pittsburgh last time he was here. So, on to another fun issue. What about wealth? How are Christians, especially American and Western Christians, supposed to be living materialistically? Must we live humbly or are we permitted to live lavishly? Is it okay to flaunt conspicuous wealth? Could this cause others to stumble, people that don't have as much access to economic resources as you did? Oh, I get it. They can pull themselves up by their bootstraps, etc. That's a topic of another conversation. But could it cause them to stumble? And here the Bible actually does. The Bible actually does have some things to say about this topic. Keep your life free of love of money. You cannot serve God and money. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. But how we've come to interpret and live out these verses has become highly debatable, obviously. And again, this is precisely the kind of thing that Paul is getting at here in chapter 14. One of the popular questions when I first got saved and around the crew that I used to hang out with was, is it okay for pastors to drive Hummers? We used to talk about this all the time. Is it okay, would it be okay for a pastor to drive a Hummer? Or any kind of luxury car? And if not them, what about the people they minister to? What kind of standards do they need to live by? And by the way, Pastor Ben wanted me to say that yes, they absolutely can. (laughs) And by the way, he has rust eating through the fenders on his 2006 Toyota Corolla, and he's opened upgrading to a Beamer if anybody feels led to bless him in that way. (laughs) Just wanted to, that's a public service announcement. Moving right along. Have any of you heard about the Preachers and Sneakers Instagram account? Preachers and Sneakers. Okay. This is a social media account that documents the lavish fashion of various celebrity pastors. And they will document sneakers and other garments these guys have worn that can be valued in the thousands or even tens of thousands of dollars. On and on it goes. And there's a lot of the list of usual suspects. I've avoided that. Most of you guys probably don't know who he is although the shoes he's wearing are worth $1,145, and the shirt he's wearing is worth $775 on sale. FYI. Is it okay for them to do that? Is it okay for any believer to do that? Might this cause anyone to stumble? Once again, it's debatable. It's debatable. And so these are all debatable issues. And there's a lot of ambiguity in the biblical text about whether or not we should partake in these things and to what extent. Accordingly, the main point that Paul is getting at here in this opening verse is that whether it's sinful or not, and often it isn't, don't do anything to cause your brothers or sisters to stumble. Don't hinder them. Don't hinder them. Look out for your younger spiritual siblings. Don't abuse your freedoms and do things that will distract or frustrate them. Yeah, you're free to do it. Yeah, you kind of deserve it. You work for it. You enjoy it. You want to have an enjoyable life, blah, 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 blah. That's all fine and dandy. But he's saying don't abuse your freedoms in a way that could cause your brother or sister to stumble. Don't put any kind of hindrance in the way of their spiritual growth, whether you're biblically free to do so or not. Avoid disputable matters because guess what? They cause dispute. And disputes lead away from unity, not towards it. Disputes lead to division, and this is incredibly damaging to the body of Christ. It creates brokenness in our relationships with one another. And guess what? And I'm getting there, but as believers in Christ, as a body of believers in Christ, it's all about our relationships with one another. It's it's so much about that. And I'll get a little deeper to that here shortly. But we don't want to cause division and brokenness in those relationships. So don't hinder your brothers and sisters. And then Paul goes on to explain why in verses 14 and 15. I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, (laughs) but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it's unclean. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. And so the emphasis here in verses 14 and 15 is love. Love. We don't do anything to disturb, distract, or hinder our brothers or sisters because we love them. We love them. 
It's like when you bring a new baby into your house. Think about that for those of you that experienced that or that you've witnessed this happen. You bring a new baby into your house, and what do you do? You go around locking that place down, man. You don't leave the scissors on the table over there where you used to do it all the time. You put the scissors in that drawer over in the kitchen. You put gates at the top of the stairs and at the bottom of the stairs, right? Are you at risk of sticking a fork in the electric socket? Well, some of you maybe. Some of you maybe. (laughs) But generally speaking, we're not at risk of doing those things. Why do we do it? Because they're vulnerable, they're younger, they don't know any better, and we love them, and we want to protect them at all costs. But we do this to protect this fragile young child, and Paul's exhorting us to have the same kind of love and concern for our spiritually younger brothers and sisters. Jesus, speaking to his followers, speaking to us right now, says this, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. We are commanded to love one another. It's a command. Let me remind you of that verse I talked about a little bit earlier, 1 John 2, 4. Whoever says, I love, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. And so, we love each other because Jesus commands us to do it. And whether we want to do it or not, whether we feel like doing it or not, we commit to loving one another as an act of worshiping him, as an act of self-sacrifice to him, as an act of adoring and loving him for the work that he's already done for us that we didn't deserve, which is all, again, about grace. That's this whole point of the series. We do it because he wants us to, and we love him, so he says, love them, we will do it. We do it because we're supposed to. And then as time goes on, now get this, ladies and gentlemen, as time goes on, as the Spirit continues to work in our hearts, as we grow closer to Jesus, we begin to take on the heart of Jesus. And then we begin to actually love our brothers and sisters with his heart. Before we did it because we're supposed to, but now we love them because we want to. Do you feel it? Do you feel that love? Do you feel that love coming to you? Do you feel that love for others coming out of you? Do you feel that love? Do you feel any kind of authentic love for your brothers and sisters in Christ? Because guess what? Guess what? Feeling that love for your family of Christians will be the single most accurate gauge of your spiritual maturity hands down. Hands down. That's the ultimate measure of your spiritual maturity, the extent that you love and love your brothers and sisters well. It's not how religious you are. It's not how many Bible verses you've memorized. It's not how spiritual you act or how holy you behave, although some of that stuff's important. It's how much you love. Here's how our big brother Paul describes it in another letter to the Corinthians. If I speak in the tongues of men and angels but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but I have not love, I am nothing if I give away all I have and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is the ultimate measure of your spiritual maturity. And it's the ultimate point and purpose that Jesus wants for each one of us. And here in Romans 14, 15, Paul helps us to understand that the best way to avoid causing your Christian siblings to be hindered or to be stumbled is to walk in love. And if we're truly walking in love, we'll avoid doing anything that could hinder their walk with the Lord. Amen? If we really love them, we won't do anything that could hinder their growth and their closeness to Christ. And then... Paul begins his conclusion to chapter 14 by stating this. Do not, for the sake of food, destroy the work of God. And similarly, just a few verses earlier, by what you eat, do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. So think about this. Each one of us is uniquely designed by God. Psalm 139, 13. For you formed my inward parts, you knitted me together in my mother's womb. Each one of us is created with specific gifts 
and powerful potential to participate in the kingdom of God. And at some point, we give our lives to Jesus and the Holy Spirit of the infinite creator God of the universe comes to live inside of our hearts and he begins to develop us and mold us to empower us and to equip us. And step by step, he grows us into the character and the likeness of Jesus Christ. And if you think about this, if you grasp this, and especially if you've experienced this like I have, and like I'm sure many of you have, it's immensely awe-inspiring, miraculous stuff. It's incredible that God would relate to each of us personally in this way. Amen? Now, contemplate what it would mean for you to cause harm to any of that in another believer. Intentionally or unintentionally. Imagine harming or even destroying, as Paul says here, the miraculous work of God in a brother or sister in Christ. How profoundly, terribly wrong would that be? This is the pieta, which means compassion in Italian. One of the most famous masterpieces in art history. It was created by the Italian Renaissance sculptor Michelangelo, and it depicts the body of Jesus on the lap of his mother Mary after his crucifixion. I won't get into all the nerdy art history details about this, although I could because I used to teach this stuff, and I'd have fun, but you certainly wouldn't. I love that nerdy stuff. But suffice it to say that the characteristics and quality of this piece are unprecedented in the history of sculpture. Unprecedented. And of course, it's beyond priceless. And on the 21st of May, 1972, a man walked into the display room, waded through the typically massive crowd, and began attacking it with a hammer. And with 15 blows, he completely removed Mary's arm at the elbow, knocked off her nose, and otherwise cracked and chipped various other features on the statue. After the man was eventually subdued, onlookers had the audacity to steal many of the pieces of marble that had broken off. They just started grabbing it, sticking it in their purse, or whatever. Later, some pieces were returned, but many were not, including Mary's nose, which had to be reconstructed from a block cut out of her back. And so, this was an incredible tragedy in the annals of cultural history, Christian history, and art history. But I imagine you begin to see my point. How much more of a tragedy would be for one of us to destroy the work of God in another believer? How much more of a tragedy would that be? And how much more is that child of God a masterpiece of God's workmanship? I'll let Paul once again expertly describe what kind of masterpieces we are. Let's check it out. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy and grace, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of the grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace, you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We are his masterpieces. And Paul pleads with us here in Romans chapter 14, do not destroy the work of God. Do not destroy the work of God. Do not cause your brother or sister to stumble and risk damaging the masterpiece that God is building in their lives. Don't risk it. Or you might as well just grab a hammer and knock off her nose. Don't risk it. So, I've been on staff at a couple of different ministries over the past 20 plus years, including that first church I talked about where I had that post-constructional crisis that I described earlier. <laughs> Surely, I think it was right about that time that I got on staff there, and I was there for 10 years, and it was an incredible time of growing and learning and ministry. 
I've been on staff here at Pathway for a little over a year now, and I'm really, really loving it. And my family and I thank all of you for so wonderfully welcoming us into this beautiful community. So thank you very much. We're really loving it. And a few years prior to my position here, I was a missionary to Cambodia. And I was the associate pastor. This was the lead pastor, Andy. There's the associate over there. I was the associate pastor <coughs> to, a, uh, to, a, to this missionary church. It was a church plant. And my family and I are part of a group of 30 that started a whole host of weekly services, activities, and outreaches in Cambodia. Now, Cambodia, if you don't know, has essentially two different kinds of weather. It's either very, very hot and very, very dry, or it's very, very wet in the rainy season. And in the dry season, everything is incredibly dusty. And that dust tracks in everywhere and gets on everything. It's like ridiculous. You can, like, those of you that freak out about seeing dust build up in your house, and you're like, man, I should have hit that last week. You can watch it build up visibly during the day. You can watch the dust build up on your furniture or whatever else. I mean, it's, it's so dusty during most of the year in the hot and the dry seasons. And then the rainy season, this dust, as you know, that fine stuff gets wet and it turns into this like ridiculously super powered like glue this like crazy muddy glue stuff and likewise it tracks in everywhere and it gets on everything and it's really difficult to remove. So we began purchasing and laying down these flagstones on our ministry properties. We'd get like whatever stones we could find available, whatever was available in the region and we would start to lay them down. And at first we'd build like a path from the road to the front door. Then it was a path towards the motor port, that little shed over there where they had their bicycles and their little motorcycles. Then later, we'd build a path over to the food pavilion, then a path to the kids' ministry area, and on and on it would go. Eventually, we essentially paved over entire ministry properties. You just slowly, over time, you just kind of pave over the whole thing. And everything then became accessible. We started with individual stones that became pathways that eventually became courtyards. And I'm convinced ladies and gentlemen, that this is essentially what the Apostle Paul has in mind here in Romans. Rather than doing anything that could possibly hinder anyone from approaching Jesus, getting to know him better, growing closer to him, I believe that Paul would have us make stepping stones, never stumbling stones. That's Paul's intent, that we are supposed to be about the kind of people that create stepping stones, never stumbling stones that we would do anything and everything possible to make it easier for believers and unbelievers alike to grow closer to Jesus and grow stronger in their faith. Have you ever noticed that there are some Christians Christians that would rather make it harder? Here's the the hoops you gotta jump through, here's the bar you gotta jump over. Kind of similar to Peter wanting, we talked about that before, but Peter wanting the converts back then to get circumcised and stuff like that. I mean, there are people that wanna make it difficult to come to God. But I don't think this is what Paul's about. He wants us to be always looking for opportunities to make Jesus Christ more accessible. We should never hinder anyone or put a stumbling stone in their way. We must never make it difficult for anyone to come to Christ. And there were many, many ways that we could have hindered those that we were ministering to in Cambodia. There were many ways we could do that. In fact, we made mistakes early on where we were hindering them. We made like social faux pas. I mean, there was all kinds of cultural taboos and dynamics that we had to learn to navigate as we were doing it. And we broke a lot of relationships initially early on. But eventually you get your your bearings and you learn what's going on. And certainly it was never our intention to do that, to create stumbling blocks. But we, we, we got into it and we learned it and we learned how to make things more accessible. We avoided those hindrances at all costs. And by the end of our first year, we had grown to over 350 in attendance on any given weekend, after one year. And by the time I left there four years later, we had grown to well over 750 in attendance on any given weekend. And that's not counting Wednesdays and other special events and activities. And today, they continue to minister to over 1,500 on any given weekend of Cambodians. Thousands throughout the week. And praise God alone for that. (laughs) We saw God move in incredible ways in the mission field over there. We saw him equipping us and empowering us and making the way possible. It's all glory to God, let me tell you. But our primary part in that process 
was that we were passionately committed to making stepping stones and not stumbling stones. And Pathway, so should we too. That should be our heart all the time. We should be looking for any and every way that we can make stepping stones for people to draw closer to Christ. And certainly this church does that. I know the staff. I know what they're doing. I know the ministries that they're engaged in. And they are not playing around. There's all kinds of great opportunities and initiatives going on here. Phenomenal, healthy ministry. And all of those things are happening. But it's not just limited to this building and this facility. It's you as well. You, you are Pathway. You are the church. It's about you finding ways in your lives and in my life to make stepping stones and never stumbling stones, making it easier to come to Jesus and more attractive to come to Jesus and more accessible to come to Jesus and never putting any kind of hindrances in the way. Right? So, make every effort not to hinder your brothers and sisters. Walk in love in all your interactions with one another. That's the secret sauce. That's the secret sauce. Do nothing that might risk damaging the work that God is doing in each of our hearts and in everything you do, be committed to making stepping stones, never stumbling stones. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to be with these wonderful, precious children of God in this place here tonight. I love, I really do. I love them. I feel that love. Uh, I'm not faking it. (laughs) You commanded me to do it? Well, there's probably a couple of them maybe that I, you know, I'd have to follow the command, but I really do love these people, and I pray that they feel that love. I pray that they feel and experience your love. I pray that that love permeates this place tonight, this or today, this week, um, and uh, all the time at Pathway. I, I pray that Pathway continues to become more and more of a beacon of love and hope in this community. That all of the people around this region that are living without love, that are living without access to your grace and your mercy and your incredible gifts, Lord, that we would help you, (laughs) like me and my team did in Cambodia, that we would help you make it possible for them to come and participate in the glorious grace of Jesus Christ in this place. Teach us to love them and love them well, Lord. Teach us especially, and this is really what John's talking about, teach us how to love one another here in this place and with authenticity. Help us to grow more mature in in our relationship with you. Help us to take on more and more of your character and more and more of your heart so that we love one another like you love them. And we'll give you all the praise and the glory. And I thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight again with these great people and in this place. And it's been an honor to be here. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you again for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you again soon, whether it's on campus or right here online. Have a wonderful week, everybody.